All right, let's get everyone set up here. So can we all hear me okay for those of us that are with me right now? Can you hear me just fine? Let me check and see how the levels look. Yeah, all right, so we should all be able to hear me. Wait a few minutes, and it's not quite 5 o'clock yet. We're almost there. Let me know if at any point you can't hear me for some odd reason, and I'll look into what's going on. But I think we're pretty much ready to go, because it's about five o'clock. So uh, first thing, I'm in my room this week because uh, there are some internet issues over at the school again, so I just decided to come here. But uh, let's go over the lesson for today. So today we're gonna be looking at uh, image segmentation, uh, kind of what's state of the art right now, and how we can use custom models inside of the FastAI framework. So the first thing we're going to look at is the segmentation. Now, what exactly is segmentation? So it's, you could call it pixel-wise classification. So what that really means is on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis inside of our image, each pixel represents some class of some degree, whether it's background or bird or plane. And we can then try and classify and localize areas inside of images to get it set up uh, to explain where everything is. It's object localization in some way. In some ways you can think about it. So like for instance, here we have some brain hemorrhage photos. And so we're trying to segment this area right here, which shows signs of being uh, a possible uh, you know health harm and so we train our model to segment that particular section of the brain or another example would be say uh, trying to identify where a plane is in a picture and so our output is this what we call a mask showing everywhere that the background is followed by everywhere that our planes are so for today we're going to use the uh, vision library as this is a vision task and the data set we're going to use is what's called CAMVID. Now, CAMVID is a segmentation-based task where uh, we try and identify about 36, 32 to 36 different classes inside of various images, and all of it was taken from uh, cameras that are on a car. So our validation set uh, was also already made for us with this data set. Uh, in the images, and their names are in this validation file names file uh, in this valid.txt. And so we'll use a splitter that goes off of what these names are. But first let's look at an image and make sure that everything is actually looking okay. So we'll make a path for our images and a path for our labels. That way we can get uh, the file names through get image files. Now, uh, one thing you might notice is well, why are we doing get image files for these masks? So what a mask really is, it's a one, it's really just a table of um, values with like zero, one, two, three. And in a lot of cases, they'll save these table masks as PNGs or uh, some other form in order for it to get, you know, decent compression quality and make it easier to use rather than say a giant table. So this is why we can use get image files for this. Now if we take a look at one of our images we can see that it's this scene of a street. And the goal for our task is to take this street 
and identify where's our person, where's our um, where's our traffic light, where's the ground, uh, and even more than that. So now let's actually grab those masks. They live inside for this data set a labels folder, and they have an underscore p. Uh, right after each of the file names. So like in our case, this one, uh, we have we could have had a file name of 0016 blah 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 blah. And our mask name would be all of this with underscore p followed by dot png. So that's what this stem and suffix means. And so what that then tells you is this o is our file name for each one that we pass in as our x. Now, our masks are called uh, what's known as PIL mask or pillow masks. And when we show it, uh, it'll take these zeros and ones that make up our mask. And eh, I'll show you a quick example of what I'm talking about because that can be a little confusing. So we'll just go ahead and write a quick example problem. So let's say I have. An an eight by eight image, okay, where zero represents my background. What these masks essentially do is I can say, okay, in this particular block right here, one is a bird. So now on the original image, which is also an eight by eight, at position, uh, what is that? Like six. 6, 2, or 2, 6, and 2, 7, and uh, 3, 6, and 3, 7, those we would identify as bird or dog. So that's what these masks really are. It's just this. It's just a giant color scheme from 0 to however many classes you have. Now if we do uh, a show, which is uh, kind of like an I am show, it'll create a color scheme for us to use automatically that shows... Uh, vastly different colors for each of our different classes. So here we can see that we have, you know, person that's blue, we have these signs, a road, trees, buildings, and so all of this our model is going to try and discern for each individual pixel. And here's that example that I was trying to show you. So this is for that exact image that we saw above and we can see that each of them have just individual numbers for each of the classes. And each number has a code associated with it. And uh, for this case, we have a codes text document that has what each of them are. So for instance, if we have four here in our top left corner, which is this orange, that tells me zero, one, two, three, four, that it's a building. That's how it all kind of fits together. So now we need some sort of a split function that works based off of the file names. So um, we'll use this file splitter function right here. And uh, this takes our file names, checks and makes sure that, um, that depending on what our masks have, whether or not it's a validation. So it'll check for uh, first this file name here, read uh, what the valid file names were, back to what we got up here for our valid file names. And then if it's in there, then we add it. If we don't, then it's not. And that's all it is. So um, now let's talk a little about transfer learning because one technique that we can use is called progressive resizing to sort of gain uh, more accuracy. And what that means is we start off training on a much smaller image. So in the case of image classification, this could be like, uh, you know, starting at 112 by 112 and then moving up to 224 by 224 and then moving up to 448 by 448. And uh, as you get larger, you'll uh, be able to get higher accuracy a lot quicker rather than if you simply trained at 448 for, you know, X amount of epochs. And so now we're not only taking the weights from 
our image net for our pre-trained model. Now we're also including our own. So first we'll train at half size. So if we check the shape of that model, or the shape of that uh, mask, sorry, we can see that it's 720 by 960. And so we're gonna make that split right in half as a 360 by 480 when we begin training. Now we'll go ahead and make our data block, which is an image block and a mask block where we pass in our codes. We'll get our image files uh, split by that file splitter we defined earlier. Um, is the total time going to be more in regards to training uh, this particular model? Yes. Um, it, image models, you know, they do take longer. With this, you'll see that I averaged about an, uh, a minute and a half per epoch, so it doesn't take too long. But um, you'll wind up training for a lot more epochs, certainly. So uh, now we have a 360 by 480. So we're going to go ahead and define our blocks, our get items. Our get y is the get mask function we defined earlier when we wanted to open it. So that's this right here. And then we'll just put in some batch transforms, like uh, just some augmentation along with a normalize. Now, um, one thing you'll notice is we don't have any item transforms here. That's because with this particular data set, all of the images are already the same size. Yep, so with progressive resizing, you save on training on the final resolution image. Yes, so you train, you know, five or six different models, depending on where you started, load those weights in. We'll see that a little later and eventually scale up uh, the image size to as high as you can go. Now for uh, this data set, because segmentation takes a lot more memory to do, we're just going to use a batch size of eight. So we're going to call our data loaders, pass in our uh, path along with the batch size, and we can take a look at it. Now we can see uh, that our segmentation mask is overlaid on top of the original image and everything looks okay. So now we need to set a vocabulary to our data loaders as uh, with this data set we have a void color and we don't want to use that void uh, label when we're training. So we'll give it an attribute of vocab and uh, then we'll make a, a method to get the particular label based off of the pixel value. So we'll just make it a quick name to ID. So animal zero, archway one, building four, like we saw earlier. And so now let's make that accuracy function where this actually comes in handy. So our avoid code is going to be 30 in this case. And that's what this is really doing. It's just saying, Grab my name to ID where void is. And for segmentation, so we want to squeeze the outputted values so that way we can get them all as digits. Um, from there, we can take the argmax of whatever have you and check them between the input and the target and then take the overall average. That's what this is really doing. So first, we squeeze uh, the target, then make sure that uh, nowhere, uh, grab everywhere that doesn't include our void code and then uh, check to see what the overall accuracy was for that. Now let's go into the model. So the method that we're going to be using is what's called dynamic unit. And so a unit allows us to look at a pixel-wise representation of our images through essentially blowing it up through an a encoder and then a decoder. So I don't believe that I have the image in here anymore, but let's go find one. So if we look at, say, this one's a good example. If it will open. Otherwise, we'll just go to this one. So here we have our input. It gets scaled down, and then we scale it right back up. And I'll go ahead and drop this in the uh, th in our thread right here, 
That way people can get a look at what this unit architecture is really looking like. So the basic gist is we send in a big image, scale it down as small as we can go, and then bring it back up. Now along with that though, each of these different connections are all uh, states that are currently being done. So it's not just we go down and keep going down and that's it. It's we go down and back up and then we compare in between them. And another thing is so like each of these different arrows is a different uh, computation that's being done. So you can see we have our uh, our key here and we go through and we can see that the output eventually is a one by one convolution. So with FastAI, we have a special unit learner that we can call. Uh, let me actually make sure that I grab this. Uh, that we can pass in a configuration where we can really customize as much of the model as you'd really be wanting to. For instance, we can do a blur or a final blur. This can help us uh, work against, say, checkerboarding, which can happen. Uh, self-attention, this is just self-attention layer. We'll kind of go a little bit later once we get to Image Wolf uh, as to what self-attention really is. A Y range, uh, this is the last activations go through a sigmoid before they go back up. Uh, this is kind of similar to what we looked at with the multi-label where we gave it a range to some degree. Uh, cross connections, bottlenecking, uh, and then we can also uh, adjust the activation function and the normalization type. And so for our case, we're going to use uh, self-attention along with a new activation function that's proven to be pretty much state-of-the-art now at this point, uh, Mish. Now, uh, from here, we just pass this into a unit configuration where we say self-attention and activation class, and all of these options are available to your unit configuration. Uh, and then we're also going to use ranger as our, uh, now that's wrong, that should not say activation function, ranger as our optimizer, uh, which is a new one uh, that has shown great promise uh, compared to the one cycle policy and uh, later we'll go into what's different about it and how we need to go about it a little differently but you'll notice we use a different fit function so now we just pass everything into unit loader we have our um, we have our data loaders we have our base architecture so this is our encoder everything else we saw above was our decoder that's everything after the fact uh, our metrics, which is that accuracy function we did earlier, the configuration we just had, along with our custom opt, uh, optimization function. Now, if you didn't know, by default, the, optimi the optimization function chosen for you is Atom. And now we can do learn uh, summary, and it will pass in one of our inputs, and we can go see layer by layer what's going on. And so here we have our standard uh, ResNet 34, because we can see we have the ReLU activations and whatnot. Then eventually, if we go far enough down, you'll start seeing where the uh, decoder is. So now we have our MishJIT activation function. And yes, ResNet 34 is part of the... ResNet 34 is the encoder. So... Um, Basically, we take ResNet 34 and cut off uh, basically to get the body. So we take off that head and slap that on the back of the model. And then the entire front of the model is the decoder. And if we go far enough down, we can see towards the very end that our last output is this uh, convolutional layer. Now we can find a learning rate and fit for a few cycles. Now, uh, since we're using our Ranger, Ranger isn't meant to work with um, with the one cycle training loop. Uh, it actually doesn't work quite as well. And we'll explore that in the next notebook. So uh, instead we have a fit flat cosine. So we'll train for 10 epochs and pass in a slice for our learning rate. Usually 1 eneg 3 to 1 eneg 4 in general works for Ranger. 
Uh, usually I train with 4 neg 3 That's just a rule of thumb that I have. And you can see that we're progressively not overfitting because our training loss is always going down along with our validation loss. And the first epoch will usually take the longest time uh, for segmentation models, and then you'll usually shave a few seconds off. So this ran for about 10 minutes-ish. And so let's look at our results. So left is what our ground truth was, the right is our prediction. And you can see that our model in just 10 epochs did very, very well. So now let's unfreeze and follow another rule of thumb which is when you unfreeze, you divide your learning rate by four uh, for the tail end and 400 for the high end. And so now our learning rate goes from 0 0.001 to 2.5 eneg 6 to 2.5 eneg 3. We'll unfreeze our model and train for a few more epochs. Again, we're always going down and always increasing our accuracy pretty much except for a little difference right here, but that's about it. And so now we can kind of save that model away and uh, we've done the initial training. And if we look at our results, we can see that there's a little bit more improvement now uh, compared to before. And that's the basic gist of training these type of models. We'll go in a minute into how to do the uh, progressive resizing and that works for any model. But now let's look at uh, inference, specifically the test data loader and what that looks like and what it expects. So uh, test data loader is basically how you can do batch predictions uh, on a whole bunch of images at once using the GPU instead of doing predict where um, you know it's each individual one. So to do this, we just pass a list of file names into our, uh, our learns data loaders test data loader. It's a mouthful, I know. But uh, this is important because this is how it'll be whenever you're doing the, um, when you're doing like server code and you're doing batch predictions. And we can make sure everything works by calling a show batch and we can see that we just get some images. And particularly in this case, we're just looking at the first five. And so now let's get the predictions. This is just simply learn get preds, pass in our data loader that we want to use. Now if we look here, we have a five by 32 by our image size. And so what the heck does that mean? Well, we know five because we passed in five images as our batch. We also have 32 codes. And so each one of these channels of these 32 channels is one of our codes. So let's go ahead and pull one of these particular images. It'll exist at the first uh, prediction layer. So now we have a 32 by 360 by 480. Now, similar to how we would work with the, um, with say image labels, we want to take an argmax for it because what's really going on is each particular pixel has another distribution between uh, zero to one of what each pixel could be. And so we're gonna take the uh, argmax at it and let's take a look at what we wind up getting. Now that looks like a, that looks like a mask. Uh, now from here, it kind of depends on what your use case is. If your use case is simply to export the image, then uh, we can simply convert it to a NumPy array. And then this is a conversion to rescale everything uh, to 255, which is what uh, normal images are expected to be, one channel images. We can make an image from array after the scaling. And now we have it in a grayscale where each pixel starts at say zero or one and we now have this overlay. And, and now we can do just a save. Another option you could do, uh, well first, I guess, I also included a quick way to save all of them. And so what this will do is say image one, two, three, four in all of our predictions. The other way we can do this is actually save away the tensor 
Uh, this could be useful if, say, you wanted to apply different thresholds uh, before your argmax or what have you, if you need the raw values for some reason. And so we can save that tensor away as uh, .pts. And then to load them back in, you just do torch.load. And we can see that we have the exact same thing as our raw values that we had before. Now, uh, I included some homework here, which is going to the full size. We'll go over it, but I want you guys to run it. So this just includes, uh, this needs to be adjusted a little bit. It should be the same code of what, as what we used before. There is an API change again, so that's why we don't have list splitter anymore. I'll go through, I'll go through after the class and make this adjustment, but this should also be the same. Uh, now we want now now what's going on here is uh, this should really be full and what we're really doing is we're in, we're doubling our image size so we need to decrease our batch uh, so we're gonna use a batch size of one otherwise we might very quickly run out of memory so we're gonna set everything up the exact same uh, resnet 34 accuracy configurations the whole uh, the whole thing and then load back in that original model we saved now, because um, our models for vision aren't dictated by a resolution, uh, that's why this works. So now you can go through, find the learning rate again, and you should get a higher accuracy by the time you're done with it. It'll take a lot longer to train. Notice before we were training in like a minute. Now we're training in five per epoch, and this is for 10 epochs. So that's one hour right there out the bat. But by the end, you know, we get an even better one than what we had before, because you can see that we even got down to the actual text letters. So that's segmentation in a nutshell. Um, I'm gonna try and see if I can make a um, efficient net segmentation model uh, in the next few days, and I'll put that notebook up along with talk about it in next week's lecture as I know uh, some people are interested with segmentation for that. But any questions with segmentation? Also check the forums while we're at it. All right, well then if there's no questions on segmentation, let's move on to the next one. So now we're gonna talk about uh, what the state-of-the-art techniques are and how you can go through and test, say, so, uh, with a batch size of one, it's taking care of the gradient accumulation. Yeah, they are. With a batch size of one, FASTA is still taking care of the gradient accumulation uh, and whatnot, just it's on batches of one instead of a batches of 16. That's the only thing that's different. So now let's look at uh, kind of what's been going on lately in computer vision. So the data set for today is what's called image wolf. And if we go look at uh, this link, we can see that we have image net or nette, depending on if you speak French or not. So it's a subset of image net with uh, 10 classified uh, with basically 10 different classes. And um, how it all works is basically you have two different epoch ranges, really, uh, sorry, four different epoch ranges to try and beat these various leaderboards. 5, 20, 80, 200 at various pixel sizes. And so what this essentially allows us to do is run various experiments with different architectures and make it sort of into a fun competition uh, for just bragging rights of can we beat what's currently the previous state of the art in a controlled environment with a really hard data set and observe, okay, what works for quick epochs at a low image size to a lot of epochs at maybe a very large size with some particularly hard data sets, easy data sets, and uh, other data sets. So it's a quick way for you to test experimental ideas with models, optimizers, fit functions, uh, everything under the sun on a data set where we have 
bass lines that aren't, say, the, what, 1.8 terabyte size that ImageNet requires. So we have three different uh, data sets as a result of that. We have ImageNet, or Nete, uh, which is a little bit easier than ImageWolf. It's 10 classes from ImageNet, a Tench, Springer, a cassette tape, or a set cut player, a chainsaw, church, French horn, and you can read the rest. Then we have Image Wolf, which is much, much harder. Because there are 10 different breeds of dogs. So you have a Terriers, uh, Samoyed, Beagles, Shih Tzu, Foxhound, and whatnot. And then uh, the last one that we have it is Image Wang, or Net in Chinese where this one's a bit more um, for unsupervised learning. And that's why there's no baselines on it yet. So it contains both ImageNet and Wolf, but the validation is the same as ImageWolf. So it's just ImageWolf for validation. Uh, or 30%, sorry. There's no ImageNet images in the validation set. They're all in the training set. But as a result, we only have 10% of the ImageWolf images for training in our training set. And the rest are unsupervised. And you're not allowed to use any of the labels during training. Now, we're not going to go over how to do unsupervised learning like this or semi-supervised or what have you. Um, mostly because people are still working on this. This is very new. But uh, it's going to be interesting what comes out of the image wing. Now today we're going to use the low-level dataset API. So we're just going to have uh, image create, parent label, and categorize. Uh, some item transforms to convert it to a tensor and resize it. And some batch transforms for, say, flipping, random resize crop, and then getting everything ready. Now to make our split, we're going to use a training and validation folder. So we're going to use grandparent splitter, which works on that. And finally, we can make our data sets. And then our data loaders. Now you'll notice that we don't have item transforms and batch transforms anywhere. We have after item and after batch. They both mean the same thing. Uh, just one looks better and cleaner. And that's kind of what they went with that, na with that name change. And so if we go through and look at a batch, hmm. That's a bit confusing. Not per se in the images, but in the image labels. That's not something I can understand. Well, here's the nifty thing about FastAI's transforms. They can't, they don't just apply to your images. They can apply to anything. And so what we can do is make a dictionary that says what each label originally was and convert it over to a name. And now we pass in the get item attribute from our label dict as part of our transforms here. Pass it through our data set and our data loaders. And let's make sure it actually worked. Cool. So we just had a transform where the entire thing was just a dictionary. So what I'm trying to get at here is augmentation and transforms don't mean the same thing anymore. Um, an augmentation is a transform, but not all transforms are augmentations. And so we can transform our Ys however we want to, even if it's something as simple as just changing what their actual values are for the labels. And this new API allows us to do that a lot easier and on the fly. So now let's talk about some of the new papers that we're going to briefly go over. So we have XResNet, which is the architecture we're going to use. It's based off of the bag of tricks for ResNet paper and uh, FastAI Part 2 last year went into it um, in terms of implementing it. And it's bred this XResNet uh, architecture family. We have the Mish activation function, which uh, has shown absolutely fantastic results. We saw it a little bit earlier. Uh, that's by uh, Diganta Mishra. Diganta, please don't kill me if I mispronounced your name. Uh, we have uh, Ranger, which 
was an optimizer based on two separate papers. Uh, this was done by Les Wright, who kind of brought it all together. First one was R atom, and then the second one was look ahead. And R atom uh, on its own is its own optimizer. And then look ahead, you can actually wrap around any sort of optimizer. And what it allows you to do is look ahead does exactly what it sounds like. We take a current state, look 10 states beyond it, see if that's a good path. If not, okay, take one step back and adjust our pathway. Uh, we're gonna look at a self-attention layer, which uh, kind of brings in ideas from GANs, that's where self-attention first came, uh, into image classification. Uh, this was incorporated by uh, Seb on the forums. Uh, we won't go over it yet, but Max Blur Pooling has uh, been done and shown better generalization. Uh, if you look at the new um, leaderboards, that's kind of what they're using. Uh, we'll use this flatten anneal uh, scheduling, which was uh, first kind of found to work by, uh, by Mikhail Grankin on the forums. And then, fast, and then finally, we're going to use label smoothing cross entropy, which uh, what that essentially does is instead of with cross entropy loss, where it's simply a yes or a no, we uh, instead grade on it's a no, but how close were you to the right answer? Were you know you horribly wrong? Okay, then we'll adjust the weights a little more compared to if it was okay, it was kind of kind of close. It was you know up towards the top. Then we won't uh, you know degrade those weights quite as harshly. And so all of these live in the library, uh, including the Max Blur Pool. Uh, dial, uh, dilated convolutions, um, they're currently being developed right now, so they'll be in there soon. So now the next question is, well, where? How do I get access to it? So um, we'll, we'll go over that, and I'll kind of talk about why you don't see some of this in, say, the CNN Learner. Because all of this is going to use the Learner instead of CNN. So first, X ResNet 50, that's just simply X ResNet. Um, and all of these that we talked about can be set as a parameter in the X ResNets. And the reason for that is, um, you know, activation functions you can set in CNN Learner, but say self-attention, uh, that isn't simply uh, just replacing an activation function. Instead, that's actually going through uh, various other layers and putting it in there. And so organizing that for all of the models that we have right now to see if it actually works, that's a, too many models. So that's why we have it at uh, the ResNets for right now, or the X ResNets. So now for Mish, we just simply define an activation class and we can see that we go from a convolution to a batch norm to a Mish. Now, if we talk about self-attention, uh, self-attention doesn't actually show up inside the layers. It's more in the forward. Uh, but that's just uh, SA. So anywhere that you see SA being passed, that's self-attention. And then max blur pooling, uh, we will go over this. So uh, basically what this does is we convert any sort of pooling layer. Uh, that's just uh, max, bl uh, max pooling to uh, max blur pooling. And so we'll go ahead and make an, X, make an X resonant 50 that's not pre-trained. Uh, X resonant is 50 is the only one that is pre-trained for right now, and there's a little bit of bugs with it, so I wouldn't play around with that too much. Um, we'll use a MeshJet activation class, uh, self-attention, and then the last thing we have to define on our resonant 50 is how many classes out are we going to have, what's our last layer going to be, which is 10. And then finally, we can use this convert uh, max pool to blur to uh, convert an X ResNet 50 to max, blur, max pool uh, 2D. So it takes all of our max pools and converts them over into max blur. So now let's sort of test it all out. So remember that ranger function I talked about? It's the same thing as look ahead in our atom. And so what that means is we can wrap look ahead around any sort of optimizer that you could possibly want to play with. You could do it with just uh, SGD, you could look at it with Atom, RAtom, uh, anything you want. Uh, not just limited to uh, Rangers, RAtom. And then we'll use label smoothing cross entropy, and we'll use uh, top K 
along with the actual accuracy. And now if we uh, do an LR find, we can see that we're looking at probably 1 eneg 3 to 1 eneg 4, maybe um, somewhere around those lines, which is usually what you expect with this model and this learning rate. Now, um, now let's talk about why flip flat, or fit flat cosine exists. So um, what we kind of noticed happening, because this all stemmed from basically a mini code competition push between uh, myself, Les Wright, Michael Grank, uh, Michael Grankin, uh, Seb, uh, Diganta came in, and a few others. And over the course of like four or five days, we really pushed the leaderboard as far as we could with all these different techniques. And so what we found with Fit One Cycle and Ranger is our gradients kept blowing up, and we wouldn't learn. It just wouldn't work. Um, it just it wasn't training quite as well as we wanted it to and so instead of one cycle we found this cosine annealing so first let's go through and look at how you can say test these different um these different fit cycles and look at what they're doing so fast ai has some test utilities that you can use and one of them includes a synthesized learner and what that means is we don't pass any data, we don't pass anything, uh, and we can just make a learner basically out of nothing, but it fits real data. And so we can call a fit function, and uh, the whole goal of this is just to run over some random data and take a look at the learning rates. And so here we can plot the learning rate scheduler, and we can see that we have the momentum over here, and we have the learning rate over here. And what this tells me is over the course of our eight batches that we have inside the synthesized learner, we increased the learning rate up to a certain point and then started bringing it back down, which is exactly what fit one cycle does. It, it follows a secular uh, cycle. And the reason why that didn't necessarily work for us is we would get back up and then it wouldn't really work. So now let's go take a look at what this fit flat cosine is doing. Okay, that's radically different. So instead of going all the way up to 0 0.001 and then all the way back down slowly, we stay at a high learning rate for, in this case, 72% of our batches, and then we bring it all the way down. And we found that this uh, had a lot better results. And now um, what we can do from here is try out various fits. Now here I did use a uh, fit one cycle, probably should have used a uh, fit flat cosine instead considering our learner used, um, actually no, that's fine because here, I guess I made a partial mistake and I didn't include our optimization function as we should for Ranger and FitFlat Cosine. So uh, one thing you guys can go and play around with is pass in the optimization function as FitFlat Cosine. But you can see that we just fit for five epochs because we're focused on this 128 five epoch um, accuracy ratio. And here we can see that you know, we're using our atom, or we're using regular atom, and uh, with our new model and one cycle policy, we get about 65% versus uh, now we're at 85%. So a lot of these improvements have been dictated based on just trying new papers, seeing what's being done, and throwing it on this leaderboard. And so it's a great way for you to test out uh, you know, maybe you saw a paper with a new optimizer and there's some PyTorch code for you to use it. Put the optimizer in, go run it and see what happens on a data set where we have, you know, expected results from, um, from various models. So is there any questions on that? The other thing I'll mention is uh, you notice that we use learner here. 
And so the reason why is with learner, we can use any model we want. And so this model net, this is just a standard PyTorch model. And we just adjusted it to how it needed to be expected by uh, a fit, which is adjust what our number of outputs are. But is that everything there? All right, looks like we don't have any questions. So now we'll kind of move on to the last bit uh, for the class. It's going to be a bit of a quicker one, probably like 50 minutes, I think, is where we're going to wind up rounding to. And that is a data block dot summary. So I'm going to include this notebook. Um, just curious if the leaderboard codes are available too. Yes, you are uh, required to include the codes that you used. And so here we can see that we have this new one. Uh, so let's go take a look. We can see that we have a total accuracy of 85% over five runs and we take the mean. In general, this is what you want to do. You want to do five to 10 runs and take the average of it. Uh, one thing Jeremy did was he made ImageWolf a bit harder as now the uh, validation set is 30%. It used to be a little higher. And so, uh, or it used to be a lot lower, sorry. It was like 15%, I believe, and now I brought it to 30. And with this larger validation set, you don't need to train for as many times to get a rough generalization of how you do. So let's take a look at one of these. Say on the uh, image wolf leaderboard. And what we find is we have um, Dimitro uh, Mishkin's uh, Pyth IPython notebook here, where it goes through and says everything he used, how he made his data bunch, what his um, transforms were. You know, here we can see that we had that uh, convert max pool to blur. And then he has this main function where if we go through and read what it's actually doing, it's fitting the model based on a variety of uh, inputs that you can do. And so like this is all the stuff that you can do with that one learner I just showed you. Uh, and you can see where each of them get adjusted for everything. And uh, you can see that he trained. So we can see that he started off with default training with max pooling, got 71 over five attempts. And then we have max blur pool, which got him to 74. And now for image net, we can see that we got his 85, 84. And it's all just right there for you to see and run right away. And that's always required for any of these leaderboards. So now let's go through and look at uh, a new bit that was added to the library, which is data block summary. Now, uh, for this, right now it's a little broken in the newest release. So until 0 0.08 comes out, you're going to want to install the dev version of the library. That's directly from GitHub. And uh, looks like it lost when I was working on this. So I'm just going to quickly go reinstall everything. While this is loading, uh, what we can do is using that medium level API, right? That data block that we had here, we can send in a few items and make sure that all of its outputs are actually what we expect them to be. So we'll wait for whenever this thing winds up rebooting, but um, what it allows us to see is first what all worked and then uh, what it wound up looking like. And then if it didn't work, where exactly in the code were things going wrong? So bear with me for one moment while that installs. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the stream for a second.
All right, and we're back. I just wanted to get all of that squared away. So uh, now that we have everything, let's go ahead and download the data real quick. And we're just going to grab it and set it up exactly like we did for ImageWolf. So we're going to have our label dick, uh, aug transforms, normalize, uh, item transforms, which is just a resize. And uh, there is one bug with the normalization right now with uh, summary. So for now, set CUDA to false. Um, I'm not quite sure how we go about fixing that right now, but uh, also on that topic, uh, for the next few days to a week, Jeremy and Sylvain are currently uh, on an editorial deadline. So if you have questions, uh, try not to at them too much. Um, first post it, I'm on there all the time so we can work through the problems. Um, and just know that if it is kind of a bigger issue, the wiser thing to do would be to go ahead and open up a GitHub issue, and then they'll eventually get to it when they have the time to. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So let's go ahead and make our data block. And uh, we'll now, since, our, since the data block is expecting some sort of path to be sent in, we'll go ahead and send it our path to learn.summary. Let's see what we get. Okay, cool. So the first thing that tells me is we didn't run to any issues. So now let's walk through what the heck just happened. So we can see that I first set up the pipelines and found all of my image files in that path. From there, we have two different data sets, our training and our validation. And we set up our pipeline, which this PIL base create is the same thing as PIL image create. Remember that. Uh, we went over that last week. And then we have a pipeline for our Ys, which is parent label to grab the Y name to convert it to a category. And now what it'll attempt to do is build a sample through all of those transforms. So we can see first it grabs the JPEG applies the create, and boom, that one's done. It worked fine. Now we go through and go through our Ys. Start at uh, the image, grab the label, apply it. We can see that now we have a Shih Tzu, and then apply categorize, turns it into a category nine. And so now we finally have a PIL image that hasn't been resized at all, and a tensor nine category for our inputs. So this really helps you go through step by step what's going on and what's going wrong possibly. And so now we can see that we go through our after item transforms, which is resized to two tensor. Uh, we didn't have any before batch, but we did have after batches, our into float, our uh, aug transforms, which that's what these do, and then to our normalize. Now we can try and build a batch, uh, do resize, Okay, we built a batch and everything uh, turns into a 128 by 128. And then uh, it'll attempt to make everything into a batch and make sure everything works fine, which it did. It didn't throw us any issues on that. Now, if we went through and instead say we forgot one bit from our label dictionary. Uh-oh, we have an issue. But where? Well... Found our items, set up the pipeline for the create, set up pipeline for parent label to get items to categorize. And we can see that we get a key error at this particular key. And now we can read through this entire error log. But the nice thing about what summary just did for us is it told us where the error is. It's right here at uh, somewhere between parent label and categorize. And what makes the most sense for that to come from? our get label. So let's go back and add that back in. And ta-da, it all works fine. So now uh, let's kind of go through if, say, I'm not using a data block, how do I go and try and use this? So I made a quick little function for you guys to work with that. So we're going to say uh, grab that our x is going to be the first item. All right, so if we take a look at what this is, 
Uh, now, data sets is, um, we go back. We didn't call it a data sets, did we? No, we didn't. We called it a pets. So if we do DLS equals pets dot day dot DLS, and then um, data loaders pass in our path real quick. Doing something wrong here. Bear with me a moment. We can't all do this perfectly on the first time. Actually, let's go ahead and just go to um, our lowest level API. That's a better way to do it. So we're going to go through, uh, split everything. So I'm just copying all of our data sets over from here to make some data loaders. Because the thing is with um, with that, uh, we have one notification, what do we got? Okay, so with the summary that you just saw, it will only work if you're in the data block. Well, what if I'm using the lowest level? How do I try and use it? And so that's what this function attempts to do. So if we uh, do x equals day sets from the training data set at zero, so the first item, let's look at what that is. All right, we get an image and we get a tensor category. And this was after we had the, um, remember this was after we applied our PIL image create parent label categorize. And so now what I can do is grab, say, all the after items, which in our case is resize and two tensor, and go through and apply that on each of my items. And uh, we can grab the name of the transform by doing f.name, and then tell it that I want to print out what each of them are. All right, now we got resize, which grabs me uh, this PIL image, and then two tensor turns everything to a tensor. If we wanted to only grab the Y's, we do one. And now instead of being locked into the, uh, into the data block API to really get the sort of debugging, now we can use the tools that they used to apply to anything. Because now we can then do after batch, for instance, and we can see, uh-oh, we got an issue. It expected everything on type GPU, but it got a CUDA. Where does that come into play? Probably right here. So if we do CUDA equals false, this is that CUDA issue I was telling you guys about. And go through and there we go. Now we can see that after flip item, our Y is still at uh, category three as we'd expect. If we go to zero, now we're getting PIL images. So here we can go through and debug all of our batches and uh, go through and apply it to anything. And this is really how you could apply it right off the bat because you could just do DLS train after batch and then say at zero, pass in an X and now it's converted. And so this way you can go through and play around with your transforms, send in any inputs and I'll make this notebook available uh, shortly after we conclude the lesson. That way you guys can play around with it and see how the transforms all work and see where you can go about debugging it. But that's about all that I've got for the class today. Oh, what is in the data loader? It says something went wrong. Yes, um, it went wrong because we had CUDA false. If we quickly just do that, you'll see that it's fixed. So I'm unsure why that CUDA false exists. That's gonna be a quick bug report that I'm just gonna ship off to, uh, to have Sylvan and them look at later because that's not the biggest of importance right now. Uh, it doesn't break anything. But uh, besides that, 
Any other questions? I'm going to check the forum too real quick and see. But I don't believe that we have any issues there tonight. So, yeah, any quick questions before we go? All right, sounds good. So I'm going to go ahead and put uh, this data block summary notebook. I'm going to expand on it a little bit. That way it's not just what you saw here. And uh, then it'll be up in the repository pretty shortly. All right, so thank you guys for uh, coming tonight. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Next week, uh, we're going to go into uh, a bit more complex ideas. So we're going to go into key point regression, uh, what could possibly go wrong with that and what goes right. Uh, really how to clean data sets uh, along with, uh, well, actually, no, sorry, that's the following week. Next week, we're going to do style transfer. Uh, so we're going to do style transfer. How do we deploy a style transfer model? What does that even look like? How does that work? Um, and I believe that's the only bit that I have scheduled for next week. So that lesson will be a lot, uh, it, it'll, it'll be more fun. And you guys will be able to come out with a pretty neat model. But uh, sorry. Along with that, we're also going to do notebook dev and uh, deployment for it. So it'll be a lot more of an intense, in terms of length, lesson probably next week. But uh, that's all I have for you. So thank you guys for coming. <laughs>